Hey, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to one more webinar promoted by NEREX, uh, complete solution providers, and also committed to keep the field of FNIRs growing. Up to now, uh, we have seen and presented a lot of different ways of how to use FNIRs and a lot of common ways how to analyze FNIRs. Today, we have here Dr. Oriuel Espina, and he will talk about his work as a computer scientist in the neuroscience field. Uh, he has used his experience to come, come up with some unorthodox ways to, to analyze the data. And we are so happy to have him uh, share his experience and further help grow the field uh, with us. I hope you enjoy taking a look at FNIRS in a different light. Uh, before we continue, I'm going to present to the team that's here with us today. So Maria Dalia, me, I'm a web, the webinar moderator. In the back, we have also Amy Young and Dr. Duncan uh, Chender helping us with all the questions. Yeah. Um, you, are, uh, you are all muted. Uh, questions are welcome at any time. Please use the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, the content will be available in our website in the upcoming days. You can look uh, under the webinars. And if you have any further questions, please uh, write us an email at consulting at nirex.net. Okay. Uh, so we would like uh, to welcome Dr. Felipe Oriuel Espina. He is a PhD in computer science, uh, associate professor at the Department of Computational Science at the Instituto Nacional de Astrofisica Optica y Electronica in Mexico. He will talk a little bit about his uh, his background and how he he came from a computer science to neuroscience. Uh, welcome, Dr. Felipe. We are very very happy to have you here. Thank you very much. Floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. Um, um, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the people in NIDIX for inviting me today. It is a pleasure to be here, and this is a great opportunity to present part of my work in a manner that is more relaxed than in conferences. Um, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of everyone who helped me during all these years across different countries and institutions. I have been blessed to work with very talented people and a lot of the work that you will see here today was only possible because of them. I have planned this talk in a narrative manner. I hope you will enjoy it. First, I would like to start this talk by briefly giving you some background that hopefully will make it easier to understand why and how I do things. I am Spanish, but I work in Mexico. Working in Mexico will have an important impact on my research, as you will see. In particular, I currently work at INAOE. INAOE is a federal Mexican government research center of excellence located near the city of Puebla and the Popocate Popocatépetl volcano, which is gorgeous. INAOE is a very small center. It is highly specialized and it only has postgraduate studies. Also, I'm a computer scientist. As you know, computer scientists are not that often interested in, in ethnics. There are many computer scientists in the ethnic society. Before continuing to the main content of the talk, I would like to mention very quickly what I understand as computer science. There is no universal definition of what computer science is. For me, computer science is the branch of mathematics that deals with the order of the operations. This is why algorithms are so important to us. But the emphasis here is that we are mathematicians. So what is it that computer science takes care of? It, of course, it takes care of the order of the operations. As you know, changing the order of the operations may alter the results, as you can see in this naive example. Each of these lines is, by definition, a different algorithm. We are also concerned with efficiency. An algorithm is more efficient the less operation it takes. And finally, we are also concerned with the algebra. If I ask you to multiply two real numbers, you will likely truncate at some decimal point and solve the approximation. However, if you will have to solve the full infinite answer, that truncation algorithm is no longer valid. There are, of course, several options that computer scientists have developed over the years. None of them are trivial, but this is what computer, sci computer scientists do. So without further ado, let's get into business. Once upon a time, I arrived as a postdoc to Imperial College to the group of Prof. Aradazzi and Wanson Young. There I met Daniel Lev, who gave this same seminar a couple of months ago. Dan is a surgeon, and he's interested in understanding how the surgeon's brain learns in different surgical scenarios. 
and across different surgical modalities, for which Ed Nils provided an excellent neuroimaging option. Helping down with his data analysis was my first ever contact with Ed Nils. But at the end of the day, this was Dan's research. What about my research question? I would like to take a minute to look at this equation. Some of you may recognize it. This is the so-called theory of everything. Do not worry if you don't understand the equation. I do not understand it either. But basically, it represents nature. You can see the three major forces, the nuclear weak, the nuclear strong, and the electromagnetic, as well as the last term for gravity that looks clearly different from the other three. As you know, it is under debate if gravity must be accounted as a force. This equation relies on fields and vectors. I'm pretty sure that most of you know what vectors and fields are. We are told in high school that fields take a value at each point in space and a vector is something with a direction and magnitude. But truly, a field is a very specific ring-like algebraic structure that is a collection of operation over a set. And a vector is just an entubler. There is no physical interpretation attached to them. Fields aren't the values associated to every location in space as we often think of them, but the algebra allowed between them. And vectors do not have magnitude nor direction as we choose to interpret it until you choose some known and a coordinate basis for your space. In fact, we know why the fields are in the equations above, to account for the local variabilities so that the symmetries of the universe, such as the conservation of momentum, energy, etc., whole, but this is only a mathematical tree to guarantee independence of the frame of reference. That coordinate system is again some abstract mathematical model object there. What I mean is that it is only during modeling that physicists choose to give some particular interpretation to, to these otherwise abstract mathematical objects. Mathematics is just the language. And just like with natural language, for instance, English, in mathematics, you can express the same idea in many different ways, some with more beauty, some with more precision, or to emphasize some specific connotation. In the case of the theory of everything, we may have chosen different models to express the same, but they won't have the symmetry, beauty, and elegance of the previous one. Back to Evnis now, um, just like nature is not a mathematical model, but there may be a single mathematical model that can express it all, in that case, with vector fields, um, uh, and, um, and, sorry, with, with vector fields, maybe the brain is a mathematical model, but perhaps there may be a single mathematical model, whether with vector fields or other, that can express it all. It is just that we do not have it yet. So going back to my ethnic research, I got driven by the search of such mathematical model that provides us with the ultimate understanding of the brain function as interrogated by Ernest, and besides, maybe of a spectacular mathematical beauty. This question is blue sky, and I am very unlikely to answer it myself, but I am not the first one to think of this. While hardly explicit, but this is what guides the field of computation and neuroscience. And of course, it is nothing but a particular case of the theory of everything. In a sense, this universal model of brain function, in my case, as interrogated with Ethnis, would be like Maxwell equation for electromagnetism, that is a simplified instantiation of the theory of everything for some specific area of nature. But on an everyday basis, you need to keep your feet on the ground. Before you can propose a model that can abstract such a complex problem, you need to familiarize yourself with all the approaches that have been attempted and their strengths and weaknesses. So at that time, I was trying and testing many different things, like regression models, probabilities, graphs. And I was suggested by Prof. Yang and Dan to give a shot to a technique called manifold embedding as a tool for visualizing ethnic high dimensional data. And this was my first contact with manifolds, which are now central to my research in the interpretation of ethnics. Here we pause the narrative and we make the first stop on my down to earth research. It would be convenient at this point to answer two questions. First, what are manifolds? And second, why manifolds? So intuitively, a manifold is a surface which is locally Euclidean. Formally, a manifold 
is a house of space, a set with a countable base that is homeomorphic to a unity set. This means that for every point P here in the right, on, on the right picture, uh, for every point P in, in the manifold, there is an open neighborhood U of P and an homeomorphism, this, this projection in here, U to the X of U, which maps the set of the neighborhood U onto the open set X of U in the destination of space E2 on the uh, figure on the left. If you need a better intuition, think of living in the tangent space. The flat approximation of that space is considered good enough for your purposes when only moving within a small neighborhood. Strictly, the unit disk does not necessarily need to be Euclidean, but for most practical purposes, it often means the Euclidean space Rn. To the point that many sources do not care for the generalization and directly define the manifold in the familiar Euclidean way, which also makes sense for historical reasons, as that is how Bernard Riemann first proposed them in the 19th century. And for the rest of this talk, we shall only concern ourselves with manifolds that are locally Euclidean. Manifolds may be a mathematical abstraction, but many physical objects abide by this definition. For instance, Earth is a manifold. At a small scale, for so instance, within your city, Euclidean geometry holds despite the global curvature. The physical universe is also a manifold. This is not to be confused with a mathematical universal set, also called the universe, and which may or may not be a manifold. In fact, there are manifolds everywhere, in lines and surfaces, in polygons and solids, in NFPs and in balls, in toruses, in knobs, in inverted orientation su surfaces, you name it. Most physical objects around you right now are manifolds. Manifolds are so pervasive that it is a time more difficult to see what it is not a manifold. Things that are not manifolds are, for instance, surfaces crossing themselves. So this solves the first question, what is a manifold? The second question is why manifold? The key to answer why manifold is to understand what can and cannot be expressed by a certain mathematical object. Here are three common mathematical objects that we often use in neuroimaging for modeling brain function. The first two, mostly everyone in FNEs is familiar with them. These are polynomial models and graphs. And the latter are the manifolds. We could have added other families, for instance, probabilistic models or hybrids, but this is not critical for the reasoning in here. Please note that for each of these, there is a full family rather than some isolated element. First thing is where the information is encoded. Each mathematical object encodes information differently. Then, as we start to focus on the research questions typically made in neuroscience with FNEs, we can question whether the mathematical objects have the capacity for expressing the answer to those questions from an abstract point of view. These tables gives you an idea of the limits of each type of model. It can be appreciated that in this particular case, the manifold family has an edge, but having more expressivity often comes with a cost. And this is the complexity of manipulating the object. And sometimes mathematics gives you one of its niceties. Manifolds generalize graphs. So whatever you can express with a graph, it can also be expressed with a manifold. But there are things that can be expressed with a manifold that cannot be expressed with a graph. We shall see some of these later in this talk. When dealing with manifolds, several problems are somewhat recurring. Embedding which means projecting a known manifold to a different space of a lower dimension so that it better renders some property of the manifold. Most of the dimensionality reduction approaches that you may know for in this case, including good old principal component analysis. Manifold learning, which involves finding the most likely manifold from a cloud of points according to some criteria. Please note that there are infinite manifolds that will comply. And this is inherently an ill-posed problem in mathematics. I am sure you are familiar with fashionable machine learning models. Many of them can be expressed as manifold learning problems. Manifold analysis, which involves studying the manifold properties, 
such as the separation, the topology, the gradient, the curvature, the orientation, etc., or manifold inference, which requires that the manifold is perturbed in some manner and its topology is navigated mostly using the geodesic world lines, causal cones, etc., to understand the consequence of this perturbation. We're going to see a bit of each one uh, of this one throughout my research. So now that we have answered what are manifolds and why manifolds, we go back to the narrative. I said back then I was helping Dan Leff with his data analysis, whilst at the same time looking for a good candidate for my universal model of brain function. And Dan had just collected data from a cohort of novices, registrants, and consultant surgeons, and he was questioning whether prefrontal response with F means was expertise dependent. Illustrating these with classical visualization might not look that difficult. I mean, it is easy to see how the oxygen demand is greater in the novices in the top row than in the consultants in the bottom row. And group-based classical statistics will be able to inform of the potential differences. For publishing, perhaps you don't need anything else. But to truly understand and interpret your data, as you know, you have to go much deeper. You spend hours looking at the raw and filtered data. You look at them as time courses, as topograph, perhaps look at the spectrum, coherence, etc. This is where manifolds come in. I said, I was recommended to use manifold embedding for visualization purposes. Manifolds are exceptional at finding the inherent structure of your data, and as such, they excel for visualization. Here, for instance, on a single snapshot, you can explore your full data set and further understand its mode of variation. In this case, moving along the abscissa axis changes the oxyhemoglobin, and moving along the ordinate axis expresses changes in the deoxyhemoglobin. The group differences are apparent, and it is straightforward to check which channel underpins this stop. That was my first FNIS analysis, FNIS manifold based analysis. But to make things even better, it didn't take much to realize that once your data is coded in the manifold, you can make analysis directly onto it. For instance, here we were able to quantify hemispheric differences between groups by navigating the manifold. So, if they are so fantastic, why had no one ever thought about it before if manifolds have been around since the 19th century? Well, it happened someone had. It turns out Freestone had already thought about it first. In Freestone 1996 paper is, to my knowledge, the first attempt to use manifolds to model and understand brain function, and not merely as a dimensionality reduction exercise, but Freestone was using it for positron emission tomography data, not for FNEOS. So while I was not the first to use manifold in neuroimaging interpretation, I found solace in the fact that I first realized this additional modeling power beyond visualization without being aware at the time of Freestone early work. And as far as I know, we were first for FNEOS. And also, it is a comforting thought that Freestone considered it worth pursuing. So as I started becoming fonder of analyzing ethnic data with manifolds, it was also a, a, I was also part in parallel supporting the data analysis for a few other surgeons interested in surgical neuroergonomics. But each one of them using different data source, eye tracking, magnetic tracking, optical tracking, force tracking. So I'd rather, rather than creating independent pieces of software for each of them, I realized I was going to need a bigger boat. That is how I created IGNA and ICA. IGNA is an FNIS data analysis tool. IGNA is just a subset of ICA for FNIS data. ICA, and thus IGNA, is object-oriented, and its central object is a generic data tensor that can handle all of these data sources that I have just mentioned transparently. Anyway, IGNA has some minimal processing capabilities, and it can also support some basic statistical models, but its unique value is that it can support manifold based analysis. I have just mentioned IGNA has only minor processing capabilities, but this should not be confused with careless. We spent a lot of time thinking about ethnic data quality, so much that in 2010 we put forward what was at the time perhaps the first evidence based ethnic quality control framework and suggest 
suggested best practices, which I'm sure you are all aware, it has recently been surpassed by the Ethnic Society Board Common Statement. Now, data quality is a fundamental topic in data interpretation, so keep this work about data quality in mind, because we shall come back to it later. Then my wife wanted to return to Mexico, and so it did end my time at Imperial. To understand some of my research in this new stage, it is convenient to contextualize it. First, Mexico is one of the countries that invest less in research worldwide. According to data from the World Bank, Mexico only invests 0.31% of its GDP in research and development, well below the world average of 2.21%. And of course, not all this money goes into actual research. When you look at actual investment in basic science, the situation is appalling. In the period from 2017 until 2019, with official figures from the Mexican Research Council, CONACYT, Mexico has only invested in science one of these years and a total amount of less than 100 million US dollars. In contrast, just the UK with half the population and just in 2017 invested approximately 11.5 billion sterling pounds, that is 0.33 of its research and development total of 34.8 billion sterling pounds. You might think 2019 marked a turning point, but no, it didn't. This is the Conacyt official website for calls, and you can see that in 2020. Mexico went back to investing not a single peso for scientific research, also official figures aren't out yet. And the educational system doesn't help either. In lower education, Mexico has been at the bottom of the PISA report for several years now. And in higher education, Mexico does not have a single university in the top 200 and only two in the top 1,000, despite being the 10th most populated country in the world and representing 1.65% of the total world population. So although there is talent, it is simply wasted. When you work in such a sterile environment, you have to bound what you aim for. So upon getting appointed at Inaoe, I decided to focus on two sub-problems of my blue sky research question, which I deem were mathematically more attractive, but importantly, where I will not collide with any of the ethnic group out there. These were causal analysis and data quality. Causal analysis is the core for the analysis of effective connectivity, but mathematically it's far more challenging than traditional associative analysis. And the problem of data quality being inherently imposed was also attractive. Besides, while there are good individual efforts out there in the field for data quality, data quality remains heavily underexplored. But in Mexico, I had to start from zero. I spent a few years trying to get some minimal infrastructure for my new lab, including our NIRS Scout, the second only ethnic machine in Mexico to my knowledge. The first one being at UNAM, the largest and wealthiest university in Mexico, but it is, as far as I know, mostly in disuse. Also, to fight scientific isolation, I call Professor Mari Franceschini, and with the help of the local Professor Carlos Trevino, and Dr. Javier Herrera Vega, we organize ethnic Mex needs. And what Mexico might be lacking in science? Well, it certainly does not lack in parting. And of course, I redouble my efforts on manifold based anal ethnic an analysis data. Going one thing at a time, with regards to the analysis of effective connectivity, there are many mathematical frameworks for the analysis of causality. I'm not getting into details, but the important thing here is that when you build a causal model, you stick to one of these conditions, and that brings with it a certain baggage. In FNIS, perhaps the most well-known model for the analysis of effective connectivity is dynamic causal modeling, which is based on Granger's causality. However, let me emphasize that we have no proof whatsoever that the brain function abides by such causal framework. And in fact, in both the fMRI, there are many examples in literature looking at other causal paradigms. 
taking advantage that next door was Professor Enrique Zucca, our expert in artificial intelligence and national science award in Mexico. And with the help of Dr. Samuel Monte Hernandez, the my PhD student, and now with Prof. Luca Polonini in Houston, we propose a model of effective connectivity for ethnicities based on Pell and Spiritus causal framework. I believe this was the first analysis of such nature for ethnics when we published it in 2016. With regards to data quality, my previous effort at Imperial was conditioned by my limited knowledge of ethnics at the time. So it lacks proper mathematical formalism. But now I was feeling a bit more confident. So I started to think of a way of mathematically formalizing it all. And just by chance, I came across Adam, the robot scientist. Adam is a very particular robot. It automatizes science, of course, only a small part of it. But the achievement is impressive nonetheless. And indeed, it was worth publishing in science. The core of Adam is a mathematical model from an area of computer science known as knowledge representation, which is just a fancy term for modern logic. One of the tools of knowledge representations are ontologies, which are a mathematical description of all the knowledge in some domain and provide the basis for reusing knowledge. Adam runs on an ontology known as EXPO, which is an ontology to model the formal mathematics of the scientific method. Now I have my mathematical framework to formalize data quality in ethnics. Basically, with data quality, we want within the limits imposed by a statistical analysis and design of experiment to make sure that we design the optimal experimental design and that once we collected our data, we choose the optimal processing and analysis pipeline. And of course, we want mathematical guarantees for that. And thus, with my postdoc, Alex Torres, and Professor Luis Villaseñor, and Professor Fernandez Martinez Santiago, an expert on ontologies, we propose Antonines, an ontology for ethnic neuroimaging for supporting optimal experiment design and analysis, and with obvious implications for replicability of experiments and reproducibility of results. In a typical use case, given a research question, some experimental design and some acquired data set, we should be able to ask companies for the optimal analysis pipeline. But building an ontology is much, much harder than training some statistical model. It is a very painful work that literally takes years. And in this sense, ontonics is still far from fully developed. But by now, we have a full first prototype. Following the methodology methodology, we already have a formal conceptualization, a first version of the glossary of 10, the concept of trees, the relations diagrams, a very small set of logical axioms, and some initial population of the knowledge. So we gave it a shot just to test the coverage of terms in our glossary against some manual labeling of literature, and the results were quite convincing. If you want to know more, Anthony's project can be found in OSF. And the question again is, if this is such a fantastic tool, how come that no one else has figured it out before in neuroimaging? But again, the fMRI community um, has thought, oh, um, oh, there you are. Uh, but again, the fMRI community has thought about it before. They have been developing these kind of tools for years now. There are large teams from many universities around the world coming together with a unified ontology and their infra infrastructure is impressive. Also, related to data quality, we were also expending some amount of time on dealing with the scale contribution. Our ethnic device was not equipped with a short channel. So we have to deal with this issue by software means. So my then PhD student, Javier Herrera Vega, put forth a highly detailed Monte Carlo model. And we thought of the problem of removing the scalp contribution from the point of view of inverse mathematics. So Javier proposed this inverse algorithm based on Newton optimization, but he added the champing correction, correction and optimized the regularization using the L code. And the results were really good. The reduction in the reconstruction relative error was two and three orders of magnitude for HBO2 and HVR res respectively. 
But let's not forget the king of the day, manifolds. In my work at Imperial, all work was done, assuming that the data lies on a very specific type of manifold, a smooth manifold. Now, smooth manifolds are infinitely differentiable and hence particularly good for navigating with geodesic. Theory from topology guarantees that there are infinite manifolds crossing non-degenerated cloud of points. But that doesn't mean it's smooth. In fact, no one has ever proved that brain function abides to a smooth manifold, let alone for the specific case of ethnics. I felt uneasy during many years with this assumption. So with the help of my PhD student, Shender Avila Sansores and Professor Gustavo Rodriguez and Professor Ilias Tastiris, we set to finally prove that assumption. The idea was conceptually easy. Find the interpolant that guarantees smoothness and that was locally Euclidean. Radial basis function is such interpolant and the mathematics behind them are rock solid. For those of you familiar with topology, you can think of each radial function around each observation as the charts of the atlas describing the manifold. So we fit our manifold, we measure the errors, and we validate the retrieved answer on a functional connectivity exercise against a gold standard. We can now guarantee that if we need to, we can always find a smooth manifold encoding brain function. And importantly, we also know we also have the first analytical model. That means that the geodesic does not have to be estimated as I was doing thus far, but it can be actually calculated. The paper came out recently. Of course, no matter how small the error, this does not mean that the fitted solution is the real one, nor that it expresses what we want. Remember that this is just a theoretical exercise that guarantee that smoothness can be enforced with ethnic data, should it be needed. In parallel to consolidating our grants, we were polishing our manifold-based analysis in, of ethnics. Thus far, we were reactive in our modeling. We accept the default orthonormal description of the data, and then from here, try to extract the information of interest. But now we go active in our modeling. Instead of learning the default manifold and hoping for the best, we can now impose the manifold topology. And we can guarantee that we can recover exactly the information we are after. In this example, using a cylindrical manifold, we can recover the ethnic signal information on phase and frequency at once and without distortion um, of phase with implications for signal similarity and hence research questions such as functional connectivity. The method is generic and has applications in studying signal processes well beyond its instantiation in ethnics. So getting to the last part of the talk, I would like to quickly show what we are cooking. We continue working on the problem of effective connectivity and the different causality paradigms. In this case, we are using minus causality and information processing, and by means of the transfer entropy, we can recover the directionality of the flow of information. This is a very limited exercise as far, um, more, more like a proof of concept, and we, can, we, we still cannot provide any mathematical guarantees. We continue enriching our Antonis so that it can deal with more specific use cases, uh, but this is far from over. Um, now that we have trained Riemannian manifolds to answer questions for segregated function and functional connectivity, we are exploiting Seagal's causality and Lorentzian causal manifold to extend our analysis to tackle effective connectivity questions. Our preliminary results are very promising. Using Minkowski metrics uh, over a layer cylinder, we can see the directionality of the information. Finally, we are starting to explore other elements of the manifold family, such as the different set definitions of point distinctiveness, the trendy topological data analysis to establish the most stable topology, and perhaps most importantly, going even higher on expressivity using all the forms. So time to wrap up with some take home message. I have tried to bring you a glimpse of how a computer science can contribute to ethnics 
I hope that my choice to make the talk narrative may have helped me to communicate what I do and why I do them. It is in the light of these circumstances, of, it is in the light of these circumstances that I think my research in ethnics is unorthodox. Moving to contributions to the field, I would say that using manifolds for the analysis of ethnic data in different manners can bring insights to the field that will otherwise be difficult with other models. So we are pushing to give users of ethnic all the mathematical guarantees and also importantly, all the intuition of the modeling with these tools. We have exemplified this atypical analysis path majorly in two problems. One of causality related to the study of effective connectivity and one of knowledge representation relating, relating to the study of data quality. We have dealt with many other research questions, but the time is limited. So hopefully this too gives a hint of the alternatives. And finally, yes, I'm nuts. I know I should have talked about the general Lima model that every, like everyone else, or the latest deep model out there that everyone's want to hear from computer scientists um, that everyone thinks is cool just because it's trendy. But then I wouldn't be nuts, would I? Um, anyway, I hope you have enjoyed the journey today. And thank you so much for accompanying me. Great. So thank you very much for the, the amazing presentation. Uh, we really like to hear a little bit more. You cannot hear us, so I have written the questions down. So if you could, yeah, if you could, uh, we j we don't have much a lot of questions. So, um, but yeah, do I think manifold will have a significant place in the in the next five to ten years? Um, all right, I don't. I I have never thought of manifolds as a widespread tool for everyone. I mean, the general linear model in statistics do a fantastic job. Um, don't get me wrong, I haven't talked about it today, but the general linear model is by far your best choice for aim every research question that you have out there, right? So, however, however, I can see a small niche for manifold analysis for questions which go slightly beyond the general linear model. Um, and for that, manifolds have higher expressivity. That's part of what I have, I have talked today. And, and also, it can be a, a very condensed model. So a single model can express a lot of things. So mm. a significant place, if by significant we mean widespread, I don't think so. If I if by significance means you know covering some some gaps of knowledge that the general linear model will not be able to cover, then yes, um, hopefully, hopefully it will. <laughs> How can we foster or help people using manifold for their research? Um, that's that's easier. Uh, somehow manifold. Okay, the, the theory behind manifold, the mathematical theory behind manifolds is 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 very difficult or at least it, it is difficult for me um but the intuition is surprisingly easy um and that's the good so learning learning manifolds at the beginning getting quickly familiar with them is very easy i mean if you start by manifold embedding and you just literally you just think of um um uh, if you take a paper Right? Imagine that your data is, is somewhere like this paper, right? It's just, you're seeing my screen. Uh, mm. Manifold embedding just means taking this paper and unfolding it, right? To somewhere strand, right? The manifold is a paper. So the, the intuition behind manifold embedding is very simple, right? The mathematics can be a little bit more tricky, but the intuition is simple. So if you want to start with manifold embedding, just start with dimensionality reduction, just start with isomap, locally in and embedding, Haitian eigenmap, Laplacian eigenmaps. There are many tools out there. There are many tools out there. And it's and it's very easy. And in the ultimate case, just send me an email, right? And we can have a talk. Right? Yeah. Um one second. So now the next is yeah. what is the input for developing ontoneers? 
uh, how is in the how is the ontonis validated from ground truth? Okay, so the first one is uh, the input. Now, right now, the input is just um, a search of terms. So you just put a couple of terms, and ontonis right now ontonis is only capable of telling you I recognize these terms or I don't recognize these terms. That's all it does right now. Okay, so it's very naive at the moment, right? Um, so it has a glossary. The glossary, if I remember well, the last time we, the last version has like 476 terms. Um, and that relies, um, so the, 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 the top, sh the top um, layer uh, of Antonis relies on, on a few other uh, ontologies as, because we reuse the knowledge. So it relies on Stato, it relies on BMO, and it relies on, um, what's the other one? What's the other one? Uh, and on a third one, which I cannot remember right now. Um, so basically, the reasoning that you can do is very naive. It's just to search for those terms, mm. okay? Which might now you think, uh, maybe that's not very useful, but by now it already helps you to tell whether you're using the same description and terminology as the rest of the people in the literature out there. So the rest of the news community, right? Um, how it is validated from ground truth, right now, surprisingly bad. It's just two of us manually labeling papers, right? It's painful. Okay. Um, so painful that we have only been able to label about 15 papers. It is that bad, right? Um, okay. We have been working, I have two students, two students already. Um, we have been working on a field which is called information retrieval. And mm -hmm. Information retrieval is about, you give it a text um, okay. and with natural processing, language processing techniques, you automatically extract that information. Right? That's the idea be, be behind information extraction, information retrieval. Okay. So what we did was very simple. We just tried a very simple thing, which is just give it a PDF, give me back the sample size of that paper. So that, mm. might, be that might look simple. It's just okay. might be complicated for, for an algorithm. Yeah. A human yeah, yeah. can do that naturally, easily, a computer, yeah. so far, we are unable. So yeah, what happens is that even though we are developing all these tools in the background to help us to automatically label literature, right now, yeah. it's just manual. There is no, if you have a better suggestion, I'm happy to hear <laughs> it, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> And the last question I see there is the manifold approach used for Antonis. Not right now, because right now it's just a very simple logic. It's just a couple of axioms, uh, but hopefully it will. So you can make reasoning on a manifold. Um, uh, now reasoning on a manifold, we can already do that. That's, that's not that difficult, to be honest. Um, it's just Antonis is not yet ready. Uh, but reasoning in my mind is, is very simple. What you follow is called a word line. Um, so basically, a word line is a trajectory over a manifold according to what is called the signature of the space. So every, every space has a signature, right? Um, mm -hmm. The Euclidean space has a positive signature, Lorentzian space has a, a mixed signature with negative and positive sides. And um, when you when you navigate over a positive uh, over a positive signature, you can move in any direction. On a negative uh, uh, signature, you can only move in a single direction. So logic can only flow in one direction. So um, applying logic to a manifold has already been done. We know how to do it. That's not a problem. But Antonis is not yet ready for that. Okay. Oh, we've got one last question. Um, I knew that was not available for downloaded before freely done. No, uh, I 
Okay. We have a procedure to give you Igna. Uh, but, but Igna was developed while I was at, still at Imperial College, and Imperial College still holds all the properties, all the right, all the rights about Igna. So what's happening is the, the, the following. You send me an email. I write to the guys at Imperial. The guys at Imperial approve that I give you the code, and then I give you the code. Uh, that's the way it goes. Perfect. Right? Perfect. It's OK. <laughs> oh, that stops. I'm sorry. That was our last. That was our last question. OK. No, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm terribly sorry that we have all the problems with the visualization and everything. But anyway, I hope everyone has enjoyed. Right? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for um, being with us in one more of our webinars. We are expecting on, on the last on the next one. Uh, if you want to know, please see it at our website, newyorks.net uh, webinars, and you'll see our next webinars there. And we'll be happy to have you here one more time. Thank you very much. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>